Okay. Let's chant the Gita Dhyanam together. It's that loose page in the book. <laughs> oh. O Bhagavad Gita, by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us, O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows, the milker is the cowherd boy, Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. And people of purified intellect are the drinkers. My is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled across mountains. Hariyom Tatsan. Om Shivadas, very good awareness right here would be perfect. Thank you. <laughs> We're told by our dear Sangha that join us online that framing is good, <laughs> but blocking not. Two different things. And actually, the words speak for themselves. So. Um, Okay, so this morning we come to the end of this grand voyage through the cosmic vision. And uh, we were discussing Monday morning, there's this sloka that, that we had read about Lord Krishna saying, through my yogic powers, I have given this vision to you and only you. And then you hit the nail on the head because we talked a little bit about what the symbolism of this is. Um, within each of us is this Kurukshetra, is this battlefield. The, the Bhagavad Gita is not about some battlefield out there. It doesn't, um, and we imagine a battlefield out there because of the battlefield in here, you see. <laughs> we imagine ourselves to be at war with each other only because we're not seeing what's really here. Mm -hmm. And we're not seeing what's really here because of our inner conflict unresolved. Unresolved. And the inner conflict can't be resolved through study or, or through performing perfunctory religious practices or this. this. This comes up again this morning. It has to be resolved through a commitment. Through a, through a determination, which has to be led with real analysis, real purification of the intellect, real questioning, and real analysis of the situation of this life, coming face to face with the fact that this life is not the way it seems to be. Right, Hari? It's not the way it seems to be. And so when we come to this juncture, we can say, okay, then I'm going to continue to live as if it as if it were the way it seems to be, or I'm going to face the fact that it's not, and I'm going to be strong and firm, and I'm going to live in the truth instead of the false. I'm going to live in the light instead of the shadow, in the flame instead of the smoke. Uh, because both of these as-if forces are within us, but, but the one who chooses to live in the flame, in the, in the light, in the truth, integrates and no longer is bedeviled by this idea of conflict outside. Are the, are, so the sun, where's the sun right now? Yeah. If, you, if you answer properly, you will say, yeah. here. Ah, is there warmth? Is there any warmth? Is it above absolute zero? Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so the sun's right here in the form of the warmth. And the warmth is what of the sun? What aspect of the sun? Ever present rays. The rays. Yes. The warmth, there, there are rays which have the properties of bringing heat. Correct? Uh, 
Huh. And the fact that, uh, you, so you can say, okay, but those rays aren't here now, but they are because the earth has absorbed the rays. Huh? Has the earth come into union with the rays or is it a suspension? Yeah. In other words, do the rays continue to be rays even though they're now in the earth? Mm -hmm. huh? So where is the sun? It's right here. Uh, the rays and the sun are not one. So, I, I mean, the rays and the sun are one. It, is it so? No. If there is no sun, there are? No rays. Uh, and if there's a ray, there is? Sun. 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 Oh, sun, sun. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. Right? If there's one, there's the other. And, and, and that's always so. Huh? If there's not one, there's not the other. If there is one, there is the other. So that means they are one and the uh, same. Same. Of course. They have the to be. The reflection. No? no? They're not reflection. They are aspects of sun. You say the sun brings warmth? Yes. What's the property of the sun that brings warmth? But uh, the uh, sun radiates out of the reflection too. There is warmth in the reflection. Yeah. In, in this case, okay. there's not reflection. Okay. So Moon is reflection. Right. Sun is not reflection. <laughs> right. I was just trying we to work with, a deeper. Thing. I know, I know, I know. I got it. Um, you know, we're always working with, with uh, allegory. What's that mean? In, in order to understand, we're always working with allegory. We're always working with stories with examples that aren't exactly correct, but that help us to grasp a little bit. Uh, so the light rays, the heat rays, the infrared rays, how many rays of the sun are there? Infinite. No end to them, right? In fact, you can parse them and continue to subdivide them ad infinitum. And it happens. Huh? If you look at the frequencies of the rays, you'll see that the frequencies are infinite. You can keep adding digits after a decimal point. <laughs> and keep adding and keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. So if you try to parse a wave, you get what look like individual waves, but in fact there is one wave. Huh? Oh. And so this is the this is the situation here. Is that the one and all of these forms are one. If there's no one, there's no form. If there's a form, there is a Source. There is a one. Yes. There is a unity. If there's a form, there's a unity. If there's a name, there's a unity. If there's life, there's one life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. So we persist in seeing individuality because it seems like we're separate. That's the only reason. Because there's no basis in fact for there being any individuality here. Look at the scientific exploration. We've done this together. And you see it. The science, modern science, cannot find any evidence of any individuality whatsoever. Right. Huh? When they look for it, they find common basis. Hmm? They find that all of the matter, every little bit of it, is what? Singular. Energy. Mm -hmm. And then when they look at the energy, and they have dark energy, and this energy, and that energy, and they dive deeper, what do they find? 
And they find this theory of waves. Yeah. Theory of waves. And so we remember the bubbling waves? The string theory? String theory, yeah. That's what they find. They find a common underlying truth. And so what does that mean? It means that in truth, every single thing here is a hologram. It is an expression of that one essential truth. And we persist. And so, and, and by the way, you take time with physicists and, and you come away shaking your head if you hold on to these views of separation. Uh, they tend not to be so social because... <laughs> I mean, really. For one, they live in this world, and, and, and in the same way as the, you know, the masters are quite social in a way, we could say. But they've all entered the Mad Fools Club because they all speak of unity when we all say, but there's no unity. We're all fighting with each other here. Where do you see unity? And so there's a seeming reality and there's a reality. And at some point, we have to choose. Huh? And so we try to balance it. We try to balance it. We try to live a, to live a, to live our worldly life and then have a spiritual life too. How many times have, has Swami been asked the question, how do you find balance between spiritual life and the practical realities of life. And what does Swami say? You don't. <laughs> you have to pick one. <laughs> if you want to live a life of practical reality, then, then it's just an imaginary life. Hmm? Because there are no independent practical realities. <laughs> There's no separate tree. There's no separate person. <laughs> uh, there are practices to help us to find the unity. But then, when we find it, what to do? So, so here, in these remaining slokas in this, in this chapter, Lord speaks to the situation. And, and why is it that most of us walk around not seeing Krishna everywhere? And why is it that Arjuna has been given this vision to see Krishna everywhere? What's the difference? And that's spoken to here this morning. Now, first he withdraws the, the cosmic form. And so Arjuna had, had implored him, please, please, I get it. <laughs> but this is really freaking me out. So <laughs> please come back to the familiar form so that I can meditate upon you in the familiar form. And so Lord Krishna says, 49, there's no need for you to be afraid or confused any longer by looking at my awesome form. Let your heart be glad and your fears disappear. I will reveal myself to you again as I was before. And then Sanjaya said, after saying this, Krishna reappeared to him in his gentle, more familiar aspect and immediately calmed Arjuna's troubled mind. And Arjuna said, 51, now that I see you, now that I see your gentle human form, my Lord, my mind is tranquil and I am returned to normal. 52, the blessed Lord said, and this is the point, the blessed Lord said, it is certainly hard to see you as you have. Even the devas long to see my cosmic form. 
So this cosmic form, to see me as all, it's certainly hard to do. Even the devas long to see my cosmic form. 53. Though these produce much merit, the study of sacred scriptures, the practice of austerities, the gifts of charity, and even self-sacrifice will not earn anyone, will not earn anyone the vision you have seen. I'll read one more time. Though these produce much merit, punya is the Sanskrit word. And merit's very important. We, we get here because of merit. From quote unquote prior births. Uh, we get here because of merit. So merit's important. Um, to be in a place, to have the, this human birth, to have, to have the, um, the mental faculties, the ability to, to, to practice in a certain way, to have the physical and mental strength and acuity to be able to, to practice, to be able to remain in, a, in one place, to be in an ashram, to be participating in, the, in these highest teachings. Um, to be with someone who has realized the truth themselves. These are all achieved, as it were, due to merit. So merit, punya. Uh, having done something beneficial according to the law of karma. Uh, and what does Shankaracharya say? Hari, do you remember how many, the punyas of how many prior births? So billions. 100 billion yes. is what he says, yeah, 100 billion prior births. Uh, and so here, though these produce much merit, the study of sacred scriptures, the practice of austerities, gifts of charity, and even self-sacrifice, karma yoga, will not earn anyone the vision that you have seen. So what will? You want to take a shot? Charity. No? What will? The desire. For what? Liberation. No. No. That's to very see. much. Huh? To see. Who? Yeah. Lord. God. Uh, and how important does the desire need to be? Is it on your list somewhere? No, it has to be the deep devotion. Not just to see, deep devotion. That's it, dear. That's all. Uh. So these won't do it. Mumokshutva, again, liberation. If that's a personal desire, it's very interesting. So there's a question about that. It says, only constant and steady devotion, only by constant and steady devotion can I be seen in my true cosmic form and known Arjuna and realized. Constant and steady devotion. Only by constant and steady devotion can I be seen in my true form? Hmm? And known, Arjuna, and realized. So he gives the answer. So Arjuna, yes, it was only for you, Arjuna. What does that mean? That means, Arjuna, you have devoted yourself to me. Hmm? And so I give you this. What does it mean for you? Uh, constant. We not not for nothing. We have the choice. What? We have the choice. What is devotion? So tomorrow morning we start chapter twelve, the yoga of devotion. <laughs> 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 Perfect. <laughs> and the Lord will step us through devotion, mm. step by step. So every one of us are devoted to something, um, like rays, as it were. We have devotion. In other words, we take our hope or our reality or our life in relationship with something. Everyone has 
something that they're devoted to. Even an idea that my life is meaningless, we find many who are devoted to it. (laughs) (laughs) You see? And it will be unshakable for them because they'll be deeply devoted to it. Yes. So devotion really refers to what is important in my life. What do I practice? Not just what do I think, but what do I practice? And everybody has a devotional practice. Okay, so I have a question. How does meditation, like, so meditation doesn't even, is a thing, but now I see meditation is correlated with devotion because it helps with focus. Yeah, and also in the practice of meditation, you receive merit. And you receive openings, and you receive divine experiences. You see, if you didn't practice meditation, or you didn't practice getting out into nature, or you didn't practice doing what you loved, you wouldn't have the experience of a transcendent unity. So there's also that. How, how is it that the yogi can work this out? this truth. The yogi can work this truth out based upon self-inquiry, study, but also experiences that are given as a result of what? Punya, merit. And then the yogi can further work it out through devotion once they've come to realize that the nature of truth is beyond what they had imagined. Uh, And so what we have, interestingly, that scientists generally don't have is we have practices that help us to experience the transcendent reality, the transcendent inner reality. So we're able to look at something inside where science, the scientists continue to look outside. Oh. So, and then one more, one more sloka here, but this is the answer. And this is the, if we remember from, from Upanishad study, and not all of us were in this particular Upanishad study. This was um, earlier in Kata Upanishad, but it's stated also there. Yeah. So this is taken from the Upanishad. Again, this is the, this is the milk or the cream of the, of the Upanishad. So also stated not by study, not by um, puja. Well, there's one puja that will do it, though. What's that puja, Hari? It's the mental puja constantly. Yeah, it's offering yourself. <laughs> not offering water and flowers and, and, and smell and taste, right? Right. Yeah but offering the entirety of yourself. Hmm. That puja will take you there. <laughs> That's the real, the real puja for the yogi is the, is the offering of every aspect of oneself to that which they've come to, to, to know, maybe not beyond any doubt, but know well enough to live it, to practice it. Is of this it, highest truth. What what does it mean to offer? Like I'm not catch man. Well, you do, you do. You generally offer yourselves to love. You're off, generally offer yourself to love. Mm. Mm. Um, still get stuck in expectation of the way things are supposed to come back to you, mm. right? And the way people are supposed to say things and like that. But but offering in that way, but without any expectation whatsoever of any specific reward coming back. Mm. So you offer, you do things. <laughs> and here, um, Lord Krishna introduces this next discourse, this next discussion, the yoga of devotion, with this last uh, shloka in the yoga of the cosmic form. All who desire me above everything else 
which is your, and thus completely devote themselves to me. You see, you can't help whatever you desire. You can't help but devote yourself to it. It just happens naturally, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When you wanted that guy or that girl, didn't you devote yourself to the effort? Mm -hmm. When you wanted that car, didn't you devote yourself to the effort? Maybe only a few rays of yourself, maybe only part of yourself. But didn't you? That's devotion, you see. Uh, whenever you want something, you can't help but devote yourself to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if what you want is to be with the highest, to live in the light, and you want that more than anything else, then you will naturally devote yourself to it. Uh, Swami Shivananda has this beautiful quote. He says, God is a question of supply and demand. Um, where there's demand, there's supply. Mm. Right? Many experiences came to Swami. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't really looking for an experience. But I'd reached a point of just wanting to live my life as an offering. I didn't want anything more than that. I come to know that, that Lord is everything here. That even my reality came from the came from the Lord. In a way it was very simple, but but in another way it was very hard fought that knowledge. You know, I tried so so many other ways to find the happiness. Um, and then upon realizing, of course, the, the knowledge isn't integrated. You know, the habits are still there and the old tendencies and all of that are still there. But having realized it, what else to live for? So, so in other words, there wasn't anything else of interest to, do I want to continue to live for a new car or to be with some particular woman or or anything else when I when I realize that that all of this is of the Lord and and only the abode of the Lord, only the kingdom ha holds out the potential to have anything that we'd ever wanted. Do I really want to continue to to devote myself to limited pursuits at that point? Or do I just want to give it all? And so that was a choice, you know. But but it was a choice also born of, of realizing that everything else is pointless. And so, so here he continues with the answer. All who desire me above everything else and thus completely devote themselves to me, and thus and thus offer me all of their actions. It's natural. And by the way, you can practice offering the Lord all of the actions. When it's not natural, it's fine. It's helpful. That's called sadhana. <laughs> uh, but, but when you know that there's one reality and that one reality is Satchitananda, existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute, then you will naturally offer all of the actions to that. Find joy. Hmm? Find joy well, not for it. any purpose other than what else? <laughs> it's just natural. I said something to someone the other day. Uh, about something, some offering that was made, and I said, "Well, it comes from love." I said, "What else? <laughs> what else? What other purpose?" <laughs> it's just natural. Yeah. Not to get something back. Why? Just to be. <laughs> Why? What do you want back that that's greater than the kingdom? <laughs> 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 and anything you do for yourself will disturb your experience of the kingdom. <laughs> and you'll be prone to forget once again. 
<laughs> Still. So what else? Uh, so at a point, it just becomes completely natural. But, but here we engage in it even when it's not natural, as sadhana. Uh, why? In part, punya, to get merit. And in part, because it helps us to break through. So, all who desire me above everything else and thus completely devote themselves to me and thus offer me all their actions and thus shed all personal or selfish attachments and feelings of ill will toward any other creature, creature Arjuna, they surely enter into me. This is actually, there's one, one shloka in the Bhagavad Gita that's repeated twice and if you listen carefully, this one's almost identical as well. The one that's repeated twice. It was in the ninth chapter. It comes again in the 18th. Think only of me. This is the formula given. Think only of me. What is me? Somebody on the cross? No, 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 no. The underlier of all of this. The absolute divinity. The source of your life. And the source of all life. So think only of me. Devote yourself completely to me. And offer everything to me, and you shall surely have me. So that's the one sloka that's repeated twice. Compare that to this. I'll read it one more time, and then we can close. All who desire me above everything else, and thus completely devote themselves to me, and thus offer me all their actions, and thus shed all personal or selfish attachments and feelings of ill will towards any other creature, Arjuna, they surely enter into me. Can you read that one more time? Yeah. All who desire me above everything else and thus completely devote themselves to me and thus offer me all their actions and thus shed all personal, selfish attachments and feelings of ill will toward any other creature, Arjuna, they surely enter into me. What is the benefit in the, in the heat rays of the sun holding animosity towards the light rays of the sun? Hmm. So too, then all which is opposed to the light falls away. Oh. And thus, they surely enter into me. So does that sound similar to the, to the other shloka? Oh. Okay, we'll close. Good discussion. Any other comments or questions? Anything? Personal desire and animosity. That is a difficult but doable because it seems like parts of that fall away in time and on their own through the devotion. There's a, um, there's a mantra um, that we've used here a lot English. Um, I am thine, all is thine. I am thine, all is thine. And um, it, it, it holds out the potential for a way of life, and it holds out the potential for a, for a clarity of purpose and a clarity of mind that, that will sustain us through the, through the difficulties, through the, through the challenges, the tests that we're given. We deal with such tests as ashram. <laughs> Things happen that don't make any sense unless we center back in that. <laughs> so, oh. We're just dealing with different aspects of the sun different rays of the sun, but in fact, they're all one. And in the, and in the world, 
when we deal with all of these forms, all these names, all of these ideas, beliefs, and desires. But in fact, there's, there is only God. Okay, so perfect lead in for yoga of devotion tomorrow morning. Ah, wait, but we should read this. And thus, in the science of yoga, <laughs> let's get there to the official reading. And thus, in the Upanishad of the glorious Bhagavad Gita, the science of the eternal, the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna, ends the 11th discourse entitled, The Yoga of the Vision of the Cosmic Form. Hariyom Tatsat. Let's close with final prayer in RT, page 174. Om. Om Triambakam Yajamehe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Orai Rukameva Bandhanam Mritor Mukhiyamam Mritat Om Triambakam Yajamehe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam or I rook me of abundant on Ritual Mushia Mam Ritat. Om Chayam Bakam Yutamahe, Surrendim Pushti Vardenam. Or I rook me of abundant on Ritual Mushia Mam Ritat. Om Sarve Sham Sastir Bavitu, Sarve Sham Shantir Bavitu, Sarve Sham Pornam Bavitu. Sarve Sham Mangalam Bhavatsu, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Shantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashanto, Makashi Dukabhak Bhave, Asutoma Sakamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityor Mahamritam Gamaya, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna, Porna mudashate, Pornasya Pornamadaya, Pornameva Vasishate, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. O adorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and prostrations unto thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Thou art Sachitananda. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion, and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. Humble our Sakura Shivananda Marji Ki. And for all of the saints and sages of all the traditions. Let's rise for our people.